Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk a lot about general vector spaces and linear maps between them. And in today's part 6, we will continue our discussion about coordinates and the basis isomorphism. However, you might already know, before we start, I really want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please use the link in the description to download additional material for all the videos. Okay, then let's immediately start with the topic of today by looking at a subset of the function space fr. And this one should be given by exactly three functions from the space. Namely, we take the cosine function, the sine function and the exponential function. So please note, with that we now have taken three vectors from our vector space fr. And maybe as a reminder, we also do a quick sketch of the graphs of the functions. Indeed, this is just to get an idea about the properties of these vectors. Because now, in the first step, we want to form a subspace with these vectors. Indeed, let's call the subspace u and let's define it as the span of these three vectors. So in short, we just write span of cosine, sine and exp. And now my first question for this video is, is this family given by the three vectors a basis for u? And now you might remember, in order to show that this is a basis, we have to show two properties. So namely, we have to check if the family is generating and if the family is linearly independent. In fact, generating is no problem at all, it's simply given by the definition, since u is defined by the span of this set. However, the linear independence is not so clear at all. Therefore, in the first step, I would suggest that we write down the definition of a linearly independent set again. So the first thing we have to do is to write down a linear combination with these three vectors. And then the result of this linear combination should be the zero vector. And now linear independence means that the only possibility for this linear combination is the Turing one. This means all coefficients, all scalars alpha have to be zero here. So this is what we have already learned and it's very important to have this definition in mind. And most crucially, you should always know that the two zeros here in this definition are different. Namely, here on the left, we have the zero vector in our abstract vector space. So for us in this case, we have the zero vector in the function space. Which means it's the zero function, the function that sends everything to zero. So every real number x is mapped to the zero in R. So there you see the difference. This zero here denotes a whole function and this zero is just the ordinary one in the real number line. And for this reason, we can rewrite this equation here on the left hand side. Simply because an equation of functions means that both sides coincide for all points x from the domain. In other words, we just have a lot of ordinary equations here. So you see, we simply put x into all the functions and then we say that we have this equation for all x in R. And this is the crucial part to recognize because it means that you can also restrict yourself to some special chosen x. And this is exactly what we will now do. And since we want to show the linear independence, we have to choose at least three. Of course, we could also take more, but if we choose correctly, three are enough. Okay, now one good choice might be the origin, so let's choose x is equal to zero. Now, this already helps us because the sine of zero is obviously zero again. Moreover, the same idea we could take for the cosine, so we choose pi over two for the next x. Okay, with that we now have already two ordinary equations and so we search for a third one. And with the same idea as before, we would say we want to put the exponential function to zero. However, of course this is not possible, but we can make it as small as we want. Therefore, I would say let's choose a number which is very much in a negative, but still a multiple of 2 pi. 
because this then guarantees that we don't have to care about the sign function again. And moreover, also the contribution of the exponential function is not much. And of course, also for this equation, we have zero on the right hand side. Hence, what you should immediately see now is that we have a system of linear equations. In other words, now we can use our linear algebra knowledge to solve it. However, before we do that, let's first simplify it. This means instead of cosine and sine, we can put in the values for these functions. And maybe to keep it short, we can already write that as a matrix vector multiplication. And obviously this is a three times three case where our vector is given by alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. And moreover, the right hand side is just the zero vector in R3. Okay, and now the entries in our matrix are not so hard. The first one is one, the second is zero, and this one is one again. Okay, then on the second row, we first have zero, then one again, and then we just have e to the power pi half. And then finally, the last row is one zero again, because that's what we have constructed with our multiple of two pi. And then the exponential function here gets a very small exponent. Now, of course, we don't need to know the exact value here. We just need to know it's very small. Because now we can ask the question, is this system of linear equations uniquely solvable? And if it is, we already know it only has one solution, namely the trivial one. And then we would conclude that all the alphas have to be zero. Okay, at this point you should recall from linear algebra, a three times three system is uniquely solvable if and only if the determinant of the matrix is non-zero. Hence, what we can do here is simply using the rule of Saru. This means we go through all possible combinations that we get like this. If you don't know this rule anymore, please refresh your memory with the corresponding video. Indeed, the important thing here is that we have exactly six terms in the sum. However, most of them are given as zero. Therefore, you see, it was really helpful that we used a lot of zeros while constructing the matrix before. And now in the end here, we just have this very small positive number, minus one. So definitely this determinant is close to minus one, so less than zero. So the important conclusion is this determinant is non-zero. And therefore, as we have said before, this system is uniquely solvable. And moreover, we can immediately write down the solution. And this simply means that all alphas here are given by zero. And now if you recall, this here is exactly what we wanted to show for the three functions involved. Hence, the functions are actually linearly independent, so it's not possible to combine them in such a way to get out the zero function. And indeed, we checked that, that this combination already fails at these three given points. So you can remember this general idea, we choose the points in such a way that they contradict the linear combination from the function. Therefore, our last conclusion here is that we have a basis for u. And with that knowledge, we are now able to write down the basis isomorphism we have learned in the last video. And there you might recall, the symbol we have chosen for that is a capital phi. The only thing we need in addition is that the basis also has a name. And the common name we have there is just a curved B. Okay, and now what we already know is that phi B maps U into R3. More concretely, it's defined by mapping this basis B to the canonical basis in R3. This means phi B of the cosine function is given as the vector 1, 0, 0. And similarly, the sine function gets sent to 0, 1, 0, and the exponential function to 0, 0, 1. So this is exactly what we have learned in the last video. Phi b is a linear map defined by these three definitions. And now we might ask, what happens if we take any vector in our space u? So for example, we could ask, what is about a function v given from r to r by the definition v of x is equal 
to 7 cosine of x plus 2 exponential function of x. So this is definitely an element of u, so we can map it to R3. And indeed, this is easy to read, because you just have to take the coefficients here. Namely, we have 7, 0, 2. Now, in fact, this vector carries the same information as this function v. So this is the idea of the basis isomorphism, and now we can see it with this example. So instead of dealing with a lot of functions and a lot of calculations with functions, we can just calculate with vectors in R3 again. There we already know what to do, and we don't lose any information. Hence, the important thing you should remember here is the sentence that the space u is completely represented by R3. And this is given by the power of the basis isomorphism. However, at this point you should ask yourself, what happens if I want to choose another basis in our u? Of course, we always have a lot of freedom to choose a basis in the vector space. Indeed, this is an important question, and we will answer that with the next videos. So I really hope we meet again, and have a nice day. Bye bye.